Hello, and welcome to the first installment of the health storytelling author Q&A series for this spring semester of 2023. I'm Marin McKenna. I'm a journalist and author and senior fellow in the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University, which sponsors this production. I'm the curator of this series, which makes me your host as we undertake our latest set of author conversations. In a moment, I'll introduce you to my guest today, Berkeley professor and historian Elena Konis and her amazing book, How to Sell a Poison, The Rise, Fall, and Toxic Return of DDT. But first, let me tell you about the rest of the semester's series. At least once a month during the academic year, we invite writers whose journalistic or academic books examine health, the science and history of health, and health's intersection with society. This series of conversations is sponsored by Emory's Center for the Study of Human Health in Emory College, and co-sponsored by the Georgia Center for the Book, which is an affiliate of the Library of Congress, and Science Gallery Atlanta which presents exhibits that ignite creativity and discovery where science and art collide. The series is live streamed on YouTube, on Facebook and Twitter and archived on YouTube. And the authors appearing this semester are today, Elena Konis with How to Sell a Poison, The Rise, Fall and Toxic Return of DDT published by Bold Type Books. On March 23rd, Bethany Brookshire with Pests, How Humans Create Animal Villains, published by Echo. And finally, on April 12th, Stephen Thrasher with The Viral Underclass, The Human Toll When Inequality and Disease Collide, published by an imprint of Macmillan. One final note, this is a live event. You can interact with us and we encourage you to do that. If you want to ask a question, please comment on the platform where you are watching. And our producer, Stefan Kaplan of Spin It Social, will make sure we see what you've said. Do note that I'll turn to your questions in the second half of this 60 minute live stream. In the first 30 minutes, Elena and I will just be talking to each other. But you can put your questions into the box at any time, and we will get to them starting in minute 30. Now, let's turn to today's book and to our guest. Elena Konis is a writer and historian of medicine and public health and an associate professor in the Graduate School of Journalism at University of California, Berkeley. She has a PhD in the history of medicine, two master's degrees in journalism and in public health, and an undergrad degree in biology. And because this interview is an Emory University production, I think it's important to mention that before she went to Berkeley, she was an assistant professor of history and a Mellon fellow here at Emory University. And before that, an award-winning columnist at the Los Angeles Times. Before this book that we're going to talk about, she wrote Vaccine Nation, America's Changing Relationship with Immunization, and also Pink and Blue, Gender, Culture, and the Health of Children with several co-authors. Elena, I am so happy to be doing this with you. It's really a thrill to talk to you. Welcome to the Health Storytelling Series. Hi, Marin. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me, and it's great to be back talking to an Emory audience. So in a minute, we're going to dive into the details of this incredibly rich and challenging history that you've written. But what I really want to know first is why DDT? What drew you to the story? That is such a good question. DDT is and it's probably worth defining for a moment because there are many people today who haven't thought about it in years, haven't heard about it in decades, or maybe even haven't heard about it at all. DDT stands for dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane, and it was a pesticide that we began to use in abundance in the Second World War, banned about a generation later, and then about a generation after that, started to talk about whether it was worth bringing back into use. To tell you the story of why I was interested in 
really learning more about DDT's history, I've got to go back to that moment when we started to talk kind of as a society about whether it was worth bringing DDT back. This was around the year 2000, so almost a generation ago now. And at the time we were dealing with a new viral threat in this country, West Nile virus. And all of a sudden newspapers and magazines and television news shows we're featuring people saying that we needed to bring back this banned pesticide, this pesticide that had been banned for 20 years in order to fight this mosquito-borne disease. And I found that odd. It just stuck in the back of my mind. We didn't bring it back. But years later, as I was studying the history of medicine, I began exploring an archive of documents that had been collected in the course of litigation against the tobacco companies in the 1990s. Now this may sound like I'm about to go on a tangent, but it's about to make sense in a second. This document archive held at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center was called the Tobacco Documents Library. And there was a lot of talk about how much damning evidence there was in these documents about things that tobacco companies knew long before they admitted them to the public. And just on a whim, I was playing around with the new search tool for this, this collection of documents and putting in different things like what were the tobacco companies thinking about and talking about. And on a whim, I put in DDT and I found something really curious. And to just kind of cut to the chase, but I'm sure we're going to come back to this later. The tobacco industry was why suddenly in the year 2000, people were saying, bring back DDT. I found that there was a much more complicated story where the tobacco company, the companies a generation before that were actually behind DDT's ban. <laughs> and so I realized that there is a richly layered story here about what we know about scientific knowledge, technologies, when we hear about the things we hear about and who's behind the messages that we hear when we hear them. So this is not the question I was going to ask you next, but because you mentioned the archive, I, um, I, I'm going to move this up in my list. Yeah. Uh, like a lot of journalists and other book authors, I obsessively read every page of a book. And so I went into your acknowledgments and your sources at the back of the book. And one of the things that was astonishing to me was how incredibly granular your research is. I'm not going to quote from your bibliography, but you talk about reading a particular person's letter that was in a particular file, that was in a particular archive, in a particular library, and that's true across the country. Your sources are so multifarious. How did you do that? How, how, how did you find all of that? Oh, years and years of searching. And so, you know, the story that I just told about how I came up with this idea, that was probably the early 2000s. And so I just sort of tucked it away while I worked on other things. And as I was working, for instance, on my book on vaccination, I came across documents from the 1950s that were written by anti-vaccinationists who said things about DDT that surprised me, that they thought that because DDT had downsides, we should be cautious and circumspect about vaccines. That surprised me for two reasons, that they thought that, <laughs> that DDT was harmful at a time when supposedly Americans were really embracing it. Um, and also that they were using this chemical, this widely known chemical to justify their ideas and thinking about vaccines. All this is to say, over years of working on other projects, I kept surprising myself by finding DDT mentioned in surprising places. And as historians, this is what we do. We look for primary evidence. And especially these days, we are really seeking evidence that has been long disregarded or buried. Um, and just one other example of that, or maybe two, I was at Emory University and with one of my graduate students at the time, we decided to just see what was in the Georgia archives, which are held right outside of Atlanta. And this student of mine pulled a file out that had a stack of letters from small farmers in the 1940s saying, we need to stop this overuse of DDT. It's making us sick. It's killing our animals. And this is the sort of thing that, again, had long been buried and neglected, but that historians just go digging for. It's, it's what we do. So I'm so glad that you mentioned that because people may not know this, 
last year, 2022, was the 60th anniversary of the publication of Silent Spring. And I think for many people in the United States at any rate, if they have an association with DDT, Silent Spring is it, that they read it at some point, that heart-wrenching hypothetical at the start of the book about a beautiful bucolic landscape and a happy, perfect town and this silence falls over it uh, as a result of this white dust that people find accumulating in parts of the town. I think that people understand that Silent Spring in inspired the modern environmental movement and, and that it was an account of what happened between those farmers' experiences that you just described in 1962 when Rachel Carson published the book. But what I think it's important to say is that it's your argument that DDT is not settled history, that it's not just Silent Spring and everything gets better, but in fact, it's, it's incredibly relevant right now. Yeah, so it's not just that Silent Spring gets written and everything gets better is an oversimplification. It's also an oversimplification that Silent Spring was published and we solved a problem and we solved it because of Silent Spring. And to come back to that, that kind of generational set of shifts that I talked about earlier, DDT's story has often been told as unfolding in these three sort of neat acts that we developed it, tested it, and used it with abundance in the Second World War and in agriculture and in homes and communities after the Second World War with everybody embracing it and nobody asking questions. And this was a period of time that we understand or characterize as being um, dominated by public enthusiasm for and deep trust in science and scientific experts. And that then in the early 1960s, Rachel Carson writes this book, Silent Spring. And this is the first moment when people realize, oh no, there's a downside to DDT and we start scrutinizing it. And then inside of a decade, it's banned. This, in my view, as I started to look at the historical evidence was too simple and it almost gave too much credit to Rachel Carson, who was so deeply indebted to the movements that small farmers, like those who wrote the letters to Georgia health officials back in the 1950s were starting to start or trying to start. It was indebted to the farm workers who organized for labor protections and improvements in the fields of California, where I live now back in the 50s and 60s. It was indebted to organic farmers, and we tend not to think too much about there being an organic farmer movement in the 40s, 50s, maybe the 60s, but there were organic farmers who were staunchly trying to defend their, what they thought was a right to farm on their own property without pesticides, one of whom brought a lawsuit um, to her local county in, on Long Island in New York and Carson caught wind of this, and it was through this organic farmer that Carson really started to understand some of the depths to which people were objecting to DDT and some of the evidence that they had amassed against, against the chemical. So to me, this is a story about our attitudes towards science and how we change our minds about science over time, but it's also a story about whose ideas about science gain kind of traction in the public sphere, who gets heard and whose concerns and worries are considered valid and whose are dismissed. We'll come back in a minute to the people who made up those various movements to bring attention to the effects of this drugs. But I think it would be important to, to frame how this story starts. That I, I think often of the, that sort of burst of enthusiasm about science at the end of World War II, that even though the slogan comes years, years or maybe a decade later, that DuPont better living through chemistry uh, impression, there's this sense that science can't do anything wrong. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about how DDT arrives within that frame and, and how that sort of sets the, the path through which or through which DDT is supposed to, along which I guess DDT is supposed to roll out. Absolutely. It's always helpful to start at the beginning with all stories. And in this case, the beginning is a moment in which we can see 
different actors kind of making decisions about who to listen to. So DDT was a synthetic chemical that had been first formulated in the 1870s in Europe. And then the formula was written down, put in a book, the book was put on a shelf and nobody paid attention to it for decades. Along comes the Second World War in Europe. And one of the chemical companies that was um, based in Switzerland, a chemical company called Geige, which was an age old company at that time, was investing in looking for a better set of pesticides. At that time, pesticides were really toxic chemicals, like more toxic than we can imagine because they contain things like lead and arsenic. People knew that they were poisonous. They used them because they were really the best defense against absolute obliteration of crops by insect pests. So Geige invested in looking for better pesticides, ones that were less toxic than arsenic and lead. And one of the chemicals that they found that had some promise was this chemical DDT that nobody had thought about for 40, 50, 60 years at that point. They tested it. It was very effective in the field of protecting crops. They were neutral in the war. So they sent some to the Germans, some to the British, some to the Americans, all of whom carried out different tests and came to different conclusions. The Germans decided it was just a, a kind of bizarre and its toxicity hard to understand. They didn't think it was worth going any further with. The British invested in it some, but it was the Americans who kind of took off running and invested deeply in testing this chemical. And one of the things that our government, our federal entomologists did was they had this lab in Orlando where they were just breeding mosquitoes and lice <laughs> just to try to see if they could find chemicals to kill these pernicious pests. And there was one experiment that they would always do with new chemicals where they would take a sleeve, put it on one of the researchers' arms. It had elastic at both ends and they would open up the elastic, put in a bunch of insects, and in this case it was lice, and then put in the chemical and then see what happened. Well, the guy, and this was a bunch of men working in this lab who put on the sleeve, noticed the next day that the insects were dead but not only that, he put in more insects and they kept dying. And six oh. weeks later, without adding any more DDT, the ticks in his sleeve kept dying. And he realized, and his lab realized right then, this was unlike anything that we had seen before because it wasn't poisoning him, but it was continuing to poison the insects long after it had been applied. So we ran with it. And initially it was just meant for war use. And as the Americans entered the war, U.S. troops and allied troops generally just doused themselves, their camps and the areas in which they were doing battle with DDT to protect themselves from everything from bed bugs to malaria carrying mosquitoes. And DDT got woven into this narrative about why the allies won the war. All the while, there were other scientists in the US and in particular government scientists who were carrying out their own studies on DDT. And in particular, there were a group of pharmacologists at the FDA who were giving it to different lab animals, rats, mice, monkeys, cows, chickens, dogs. And what they noticed was that in particular, they noticed this with dogs, female dogs who took DDT into their bodies then expressed it in their breast milk. And then the DDT in the breast milk was then passed on to their offspring and could be detected in the bodies of the puppies. This to the FDA was extraordinarily troublesome. And so they told the army, slow down, we need to do more research. And the US Army, and this is the beauty of looking at these primary documents, replied to the FDA and said, you can keep doing the research and we're gonna keep using this pesticide. Mm. And that was the moment where we kind of had this great divide between really boosters for DDT taking the lead and critics saying we need to slow down, but nobody was listening to them. I'm going to remind folks who are watching, I can see that there are plenty of you out there because I can see the count um, that that you can put in comments at any moment uh, and we will get to them in the second half of this hour. We would love to know what you think about this interesting tangled, tragic story. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to ask Elena some more questions.
So uh, I am super struck by that story of the government volunteers who are testing this on themselves or who are volunteering to be part of the tests. But of course, an important part of this story is that there were so many people who lived in the environments when, where DDT came to be distributed who were unwitting participants in experiments. And many of them were people who were in many ways disenfranchised. And so I wonder if you can talk about that, that history, which is a history of racial injustice and environmental injustice and how those strands become woven into the story. Absolutely. This is such an important part of the story and part of why DDT in my mind was worth revisiting and looking at again. There are so many examples that I could use to illustrate this pattern that you're talking about. And I think that I'll highlight two of them. One of them had to do with government production of DDT, where it created the sites that would manufacture DDT for the war and then manufacture DDT for the consumer market after the war. And the communities that lived near those sites becoming completely unwittingly exposed to DDT in their environment over time. And I'll say more about that in a moment because another piece of it had to do with the government realizing in the Second World War that DDT was this powerful way of protecting people from disease. It was initially tested for crops, but they used it on US troops to protect them from malaria, from typhus, from other vector-borne diseases. And so there was this move during the war and then it continued after the war by both federal government and local health officials to use DDT to stop the spread of diseases. And so throughout the South, throughout the malaria belt, countless communities, um, rural communities, often low-income communities, many of them communities of color, were sprayed heavily with DDT in the name of malaria eradication. Malaria, to, malaria was all, already on the decline at this time, but DDT was used in this last push where it was sprayed um, aerially in the community, but also health officials went door to door and asked people to step outside as they went inside and literally coated their homes and all of their belongings with DDT. There was one, there are photos of this and you can see families. I have a photo that I found in the CDC archives of a black family in South Carolina sitting on the porch of their home surrounded by the belongings that they didn't want covered in DDT while the DDT crew goes inside and sprays everything. There are photos in those archives of communities in Puerto Rico also greeting the, the government sprayers and letting them into their homes. And one of my favorite accounts of this was a written account by a woman whose husband was serving in the US Army and she went overseas with him and was in their home while the DDT crew arrived and she had a young baby with her. This was after the war. And she wrote this detailed description about how this team of six men covered head to toe in protective gear with masks and like backpacks and long sprayers doused everything until as she put it, the, the light fixtures were dripping with DDT. The table was dripping with DDT. And as they walked out the door, they said, oh, don't let, any, don't let the baby touch any of the DDT. <laughs> and she was just <laughs> floored. How is this what we're doing if it's not even safe for my child? So these are the two kinds of stories of exposure to DDT that were happening really from the moment of the war through the decades after the war. And to come to one brief story of environmental justice, which maybe we'll have some time to get into more deeply, um, the communities that were situated near the factories that manufactured DDT were there thinking that the factories had little to do with the state of their environment. And meanwhile, these factories manufactured, I think it was close to 100 million pounds annually of DDT by the end of the 1950s, churning it out 
with DDT waste, some of which contain DDT itself, going into the local environment, getting into the water table, getting into the soil, and now we have to come back to that sleeve. DDT was so persistent that it stayed there. It stayed in the water, it stayed in the soil. And not only that, it started to build up in the natural environment in ways that meant that for some communities, it ended up in their own soil, in their backyards, it ended up in their drinking water, but most importantly, it ended up in their food supply. It ended up in the local sources of food, whether it was um, it fish in one case that I write about in the book or um, other forms of wildlife that people were subsisting on. We can go either of two ways here. I'd yeah. like to hear some more about that community that I think one community in particular that you're talking about, Triana in Alabama. Mm -hmm. But but embedded in that story, I think also is this recognition dawning at the time that DDT is different from other toxins, that it has a different mode of accumulating in the environment, that it's not just an acute dose that actually makes the poison, but rather the, the chronic accumulation over time. Exactly. So I want to hear about both of those. You, you choose which to go I first. I talk about both of them at the same time because they're related. We knew from the get-go that DDT had staying power. You sprayed it and it didn't go away. It took us a lot longer to realize that that meant that DDT built up in food chains. So the organisms that were at the bottom of the food chain had a little bit of DDT in them, but then the birds that fed on those worms had more DDT in them. And then the birds of prey that fed on smaller organisms had even more DDT in them. And the pattern that we see or began to see in the 19, late 1960s was that it was top of the food chain organisms that even decades after DDT was first applied were bearing these enormous body burdens of this chemical. Jump to the late 1970s, about five years after DDT's ban, there were scientists, both government and private scientists, who were monitoring wildlife in different parts of the country for DDT. And in the Southeast, some of these scientists were looking at wildlife in the Tennessee, Tennessee Valley Authority and also in some of the um, U.S. Forest Service land and U.S. Um, parks in the South. Some of these scientists found that there were fish in the Tennessee River that had extraordinarily high levels of DDT. This is five years after DDT was banned. They noted it, they wrote about it, they said, okay, this deserves more study. And this got a few mentions in government bulletins, hardly any mentions in the press. But in one of those government bulletins, that article about these levels in fish came to the attention of a government scientist named Clyde Foster, who happened to not just be a scientist, he was also one of the first black mayors in Alabama. And at the time that he was working for the government, um, for NASA, he was also the mayor of the small town of Triana in northeastern Alabama. And this matters because he saw this report about DDT levels in fish, and he put it together with something he knew about his town. His town was 98% black, and most of the residents were living at poverty or below poverty, which meant that many of them were reliant on fish from the Tennessee River. And for many others, even if they weren't reliant, fish from the river was a normal part of their diet. It was a dietary staple. And so Foster saw this and said, if there's DDT in this fish now, how much DDT is in the people in my town? He was an incredible man, so resourceful. And I feel so honored to have had the chance to talk to members of his family who shared stories and materials about him. And what I saw was that he just so impressively had the ability within a week to get the CDC, the TVA, and the EPA, three major government agencies down to his town to start investigating. And what CDC scientists found 
was that the level of DDT in the bodies of the first few people that they tested in Triana were the highest levels of DDT ever detected in any human being anywhere in the earth in all of the decades that DDT had been used. All of our research primarily to that point had focused on people who were using DDT in the war, who were manufacturing DDT, to some extent, farm workers who were using DDT in the fields, and we had completely missed this other form of exposure. Foster ended up bringing loads of media attention to this. It was the late 1970s, and within a year, it was completely eclipsed by the tragedy at Love Canal. And Foster saw immediately a racial dimension to this and said, there is no other explanation for why Love Canal is making the evening news and Triana is getting ignored at this point, and it has entirely to do with race. He fought against that tooth and nail and ended up securing, with the help of his community, um, a massive, 24 million, if I'm remembering the number right, settlement from the chemical company that manufactured the DDT that poisoned the fish that his community was reliant on. But it turned out that after the lawyers were paid, after the environmental cleanup was covered, the amount of that multi-million dollar settlement that went to the people in the town was I mean, by today's standards, paltry. By those standards, not the, the standards of the early 1980s when this was settled, not insignificant, but not nearly enough to make up for decades of exposure and toxicity. It's such a but, sad story. Yes. I, I think it's important to go back over what you mentioned at the when we first started talking, which was that this story is not just a story of more scientific knowledge gradually being gained, but rather that there was active pushback and active disinformation going on at the time, um, perpetrated by some of the most significant actors in mis and disinformation in the 20th century. So tell us a bit more about that, about these forces that people elucidating the true impact of DDT had to push back against. Yeah, this is such a complicated story, Marin, and I really struggled with how to tell this because on the one hand, DDT is manufactured by chemical companies in the US at least, who are invited during the war, during the war, not so much after the war, but to some extent after the war, to manufacture this chemical for the government at the government's request and behest. They, of course, want to make money off of it, so they also market it to consumers. They, of course, are well aware of the risks associated with it, but they're thinking about those risks in comparison to the risks of lead and arsenic. So we have corporate interests driving consumption of DDT, but also focus on its benefits. We have government interest driving consumption of DDT and trust in DDT and also focus on its benefits. And then we really see at the same time, both groups denying the complaints that they're hearing from, in some cases, their own scientists, and in other cases, members of communities like those small farmers who wrote to government officials in the 1940s to say, DDT may be helpful, but all my chicks and my bees are dying. What's going on here? And they noted that long before the environmentalists of the 1960s pointed that out. So what we see at the beginning is this complicated story of how both corporations, industry, and government had reasons for downplaying the risks of DDT, um, had maybe less justifiable reasons for ignoring <laughs> the concerns of communities that were brought to them. And then over time, what we see, and this is where the story gets a little complicated, is that as more and more attention is brought to the concerns of small farmers, farm workers, um, organic farmers and the like, as more and more attention is brought to DDT's harms by Rachel Carson and the environmental scientists who were focusing their work on pesticides in the 1960s, 
now the chemical industry isn't just ignoring <laughs> the, the risks of DDT. Now they're engaging in active campaigns to deny those risks. And this is where, and they actually start this in the 1950s, but this is where we start to see the kind of um, modern patterns of science denial on the part of industry start to show. It was really in the 1950s that the chemical industry reached out to public relations firms on Madison Avenue in New York and said, help us figure out how to keep not just DDT, but all the post-war chemicals, good reputations intact. And the PR firms came up with strategies that were so good that the tobacco companies then borrowed and then expanded on them. <laughs> and so we have this tangled history of these interests kind of deciding to use their power one way in one moment, another way in another moment, we see the tobacco industry using these strategies to deny the harms of smoking, and then also deciding later on in the late 1960s and 1970s to try to use some of their own PR strategies along with just good old fashioned lobbying to try to get DDT banned. And this is another surprising part of this story. We attribute the ban of DDT in this country to social movements and to civil society but behind the scenes, the tobacco industry was looking at the accumulation of DDT in soil and in crops, and they were looking at regulations being passed in Europe, and they were worried that they were no longer going to be able to sell U.S. tobacco to European markets that had decided that there was too much DDT in all of their products. And so the tobacco companies then started to lobby to have DDT banned. So now we've got, you know, these two industries now, you know, on the one hand kind of following lockstep and then kind of parting ways and working against each other to the chemical industry, you know, by the time DDT was banned, they had loads more chemicals to offer the public. And so in a way they decided okay, this might as well be a sacrificial lamb, ban DDT, we'll replace it with other chemicals that we'll sell to the public instead. This is a good time to pose a, a, a question from one of the folks watching. So um, from Paula, uh, forgive me if I mis I'm mispronouncing your name since we don't get uh, pronunciation guides uh, in our comments, but Paula, possibly Kiger, asks, what's the best way to to coach people to handle this kind of denialism and misinformation? Um, how can we help consumers to look past denialism and, and, and um, deceptive advertising? Yeah, I think this is such a good and important question. And I always come back to two things. One is that regulation is, is important here, that when regulation works, it does serve to protect the US consumer um, from deceptive advertising. And when DDT was rolled onto the consumer market back in the 1940s and 50s, people were in fact sold what looked like lies from today's perspective. They were told, for instance, that DDT would protect their babies from polio and measles and scarlet fever. This was not true, but it was close to a then prevailing truth, which was that DDT had protected people, not just soldiers, but prisoners of war and people um, in many parts of the globe who were dealing with heavy burdens of insect-borne diseases. Millions of people around the globe had been protected from those diseases by DDT. So regulation in this case stepped in probably a little bit too late, but eventually it did come to override these lies in advertising. Your question though about how to protect yourself is one, I think generally support the cause of regulation in general, but two, to know that, and, and this is, oversimplifying something that we could probably spend a whole hour talking about, but none of these corporations or companies manufacturing DDT 
wanted to harm consumers. They wanted to sell a product, but it wasn't in their interest to sell a product that was going to be toxic. It might not have cost them much if that toxicity wouldn't be known for decades. And that's what happened with DDT. But in the short term, they believed in the safety of their product. And they were operating in a kind of cultural milieu that most of the rest of the country was operating in, which was one in which we decided to accept in some ways the risks associated with synthetic chemicals in exchange for the benefits of those chemicals. And this speaks to a kind of larger trade-off um, in the history of technology, that there are few technologies that come with zero risks, but we decide at different points in time and for different reasons to accept, accept some of those risks to some extent in exchange for the benefits we reap. So this is a great segue to the last act of DDT's story, which is the DDT comes back, right? Yes. That, that that balance between what are the harms and what are, what are the are the benefits, which has been tilted toward consideration of the harms for several decades, begins to tip back to a consideration of its benefits again. So tell us about how that happens. Yeah, so it comes back in three ways. And first, let me talk about the, the one way in which it comes back at around the turn of the new millennium, around the year 2000. At that point, there was a lot of talk among malaria scientists and scholars and physicians all around the globe about how malaria rates in certain parts of the world were skyrocketing. We had had a global malaria eradication campaign launched by the World Health Organization back in the 1950s. It made strides in the 50s and 60s and then was abandoned by the end of that decade. And throughout the 80s and 90s, malaria rates rose, especially in the global south, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, especially in certain parts of Asia. And malariologists and other folks working um, in these areas where malaria had just reared up again, were saying, we might need to reconsider some old tools. Maybe there is a safe or more effective way to use DDT. As a side note, I should say that one of the major problems with DDT in the eradication campaign of the 50s and 60s was overuse that led the mosquitoes to breed resistance. They were no longer, um, they, would no, they were no longer vulnerable to DDT. There's more to that story, but to come back to the year 2000, this represents this moment when people in the scientific community were saying, we might need to reconsider use of DDT. This was happening alongside a conversation happening among environmental scientists who were saying, at this point in history, we know some of the most pernicious, persistent chemicals that we have manufactured and it's time to ban them globally. And more than a hundred countries came together to draft and sign the Stockholm POPs Convention. This was a, a convention to ban persistent organic pollutants. DDT was on the list. So at this very same moment, we have two different movements, one from public health saying we need to reevaluate DDT, one from the environmental scientists saying we need to just ban DDT globally. And conservative actors catch wind of this debate draft up a proposal that they send to the tobacco companies and say, look at this, liberals are fighting over DDT. Let's put out, let's start a campaign that says that DDT never should have been banned in the first place, that its ban led to the death of millions of children in sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere, and that the moral of that story is regulation, particularly global regulation and Western regulation, is wrong and shouldn't be trusted. And the tobacco companies funded it. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. They funded it because they were facing increased regulation due to global tobacco conventions. We'll mute you for a minute while, yeah, while please, Zoom no, puppy gets deal with that with me. <laughs> Um, so do you want to go on with that? Did, did your puppy distract you? 
<laughs> okay. So I think this is a great moment to ask because we are actually in the last 15 minutes of the hour. Um, what's the relevance of the DDT story to today? Um, we have a comment um, from an Emory colleague, colleague, Rachel Hall Clifford, asking, can we draw parallels between this and the, the train derailment and vast toxic release in East Palestine, Ohio? What have we learned about uh, how we approach risks like this? And, and maybe we can even slide that over to what, do, what have we learned about in the past couple of years of the COVID pandemic about how to evaluate and balance risk and how to communicate around risk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is such a good question. I wanna make sure that I'm off mute and you guys can all hear me. Can hear you. Yeah, this is such an important question. So um, to go back to that story about tobacco for just a brief moment, what that revealed to me was that here was an industry weighing in on an issue, swaying the public's opinion about DDT, when this industry had nothing to do with DDT. The tobacco industry no longer had any specific interest in selling DDT, protecting DDT, um, or getting people to trust DDT. Their interest was a bigger political one that had to do with undermining public support for regulation. And this is so relevant to today because it tells us a couple of things. One thing that it tells us is that there are actors manipulating the information that we hear and they're doing so out of interest that we aren't even going to conceive of or imagine. The, and this maybe by this point in time has become something that, you know, since the, the 2016 election, we've become kind of more comfortable with that there are forces outside of our purview, outside of what we can see, just trying to divide us against ourselves and succeeding at that. And this was an example of how we were being encouraged to fight over something that, you know, was ostensibly a scientific issue with scientific arguments on both sides and could have been dealt with in just that way, but was instead politicized. And this is exactly what I see going on with the train derailment, this toxic tragedy in Ohio that has been turned or was turned immediately into a political story with every layer of it politicized. Oh, you know, who was responsible from both sides? Who was responsible for deregulating the, the, the trains? Who was responsible for, um, you know, deciding that we were going to address this through that kind of a supposed controlled burn to who's going to be responsible for cleanup and what attention are they going to give to this versus other toxic sites. The minute we turn these toxic tragedies into political stories, we just do ourselves harm because we divide ourselves against each other instead of against the source of the toxicity. We have created a world in which we are just deeply dependent on synthetic chemicals. I was looking recently at an estimate and I was shocked at how many synthetic chemicals and chemical mixtures there are in production and use right now. And I believe it was somewhere on the order of more than 300,000, not all of those widely used, but the vast, vast majority of them very poorly understood in terms of their toxicity to humans and the environment. And we've created and have kind of agreed to participate in economic systems in which this is the norm. So these toxic tragedies very, very tragically are an inherent risk that we assume when we decide that these chemicals are an intrinsic part of our daily lives one could argue that we're not all deciding that, but these chemicals are in everything from, you know, the laptop that I'm talking to you on to the shampoo I use in my hair this morning. They're in everything. This goes back to that question about how to be a wise consumer. We focus so much on individual chemicals in this country, and DDT is an example of this too. 
find the bad actor and ban it. Find the bad actor and avoid it in the products you buy. But what we've made very, very clear in decades of doing this is it's not enough. We ban one, two, 10, 20, and there are hundreds or thousands more that are still in use. We ban those and then we find that their replacements have toxic qualities that we weren't aware of either. So this is, um, it, this is sort of very nihilistic a note to leave, uh, to you know, introduce, but I think we've got to ask ourselves some really hard questions about how collectively we want to balance these risks and benefits and whether we even have the capacity to stop politicizing it and agree that if these are chemicals that we're going to have in our environment, then we should ha have better ways of dealing with their risks and better ways of ensuring that those risks don't just fall on those who are already the most economically or socially marginalized. Now, we have a comment um, from, uh, well, his, his public name is Epi Ren, but he's a, a frontline public health professional, reminding us that these um, the debate over whether to return to DDT was um, was raised as recently as the Zika epidemic, and that there was at that moment, and this is just a couple of years ago, um, again, that that attempt to balance these competing questions from competing actors about what does public health think is appropriate? What do policymakers think is appropriate? What are the needs of the people on the ground? So this is not, uh, a, it, 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 um, it's an equation that is not leaving our public life. We have to keep reworking this time and time again. Yeah. I, I want to ask you, um, and I think this is sort of what will go out on, is especially given the past couple of years, especially given the, the COVID pandemic and the questions of how to process risk and how to communicate risk that that brought to societies, to all societies, really. What lessons do you draw looking back at the various acts in the history of DDT about what's necessary? to communicate clearly and accurately to uh, understanding, acknowledging the nuances about risks in public health? Yeah, let me answer that question in a slightly broader way because there are several lessons that I drew from this history of DDT. One, very simply put, is there's no going back. Once we unleash these technologies, we live with them for decades, maybe centuries, maybe longer than that. They become part of our environment. They become part of our bodies and the generations of bodies that come after us. We talked about a few moments ago why DDT was still relevant today. One reason is because it's this kind of early illustration of the forces behind misinformation and disinformation. But another reason is as I was writing this, I actually started writing it during the Zika um, outbreak and scare and noted that people were bringing up DDT back then. And it was a sign to me that DDT was not just physically still with us, but kind of symbolically still with us. And yet by the time I got to the end of writing the book in 2020, there were barrels of DDT discarded in the Pacific Ocean that were being rediscovered for the first time off the coast of Southern California. And so DDT was suddenly back physically too. And scientists were connecting this just trash heap of DDT in the ocean with high levels of DDT and cancer in certain sea mammals in recent years. So lesson number one, these technologies have long legacies and toxic chemicals in particular have long legacies. These one-off bans, they, they're important, but they don't address the problem of the long tail of toxicity. The second major kind of takeaway that I wanna highlight, and I'll probably leave it at that one so we have time for one more point after this, but the second major one is this history of DDT to me was so eye-opening because it allowed me to see so many different points of origin for public mistrust and distrust in science. And 
that mistrust and distrust in science that we see today, whether it has to do with, you know, not trusting what we're being told about the train derailment or about COVID or about, I don't know, GMOs or vaccines, that distrust has deep, deep roots in this post-war moment in which we were moving forward enthusiastically with certain technologies, denying or dismissing not just certain risks, but the concerns of certain communities, and then really allowing industry to manipulate public narratives. All of these forces work together to really erode, to critically erode multiple communities' ability to trust in science and scientific institutions. In some cases, in some cases, it eroded their trust in government and government scientists. So it's really the story of how we got to this moment of present crisis in terms of trust. And take us out on a hopeful note, if you can. Do you I see will. any reason for optimism? Do I, you feel like we've learned those lessons? I so there's something different that I want to offer in terms of optimism. Um, and I, I struggle with this to this day, but as I was reading primary documents on DDT from the 1940s, I began to realize something that in the 1940s, there were people who believed so strongly in DDT and wanted to prove its, its healthfulness that they just Ate it. There was a story of a scientist representing Geige who went to visit the Surgeon General and said, sir, I promise you this is safe. And he just ate a chunk of it. And, <laughs> and the Surgeon General said, if you're alive tomorrow, I'll, I'll you know, place a big order <laughs> with your company. What I came to realize was that DDT was a bad actor, but it wasn't the worst actor. Alongside DDT, there were so many worse technologies chemicals, chemical pesticides that were so toxic that they led to horrible tragedies. Children who were just literally splashed with a drop and died foaming at the mouth within minutes. What I do believe is that regulation can work on our behalf if we allow scientists and within industry and within government to communicate openly and honestly about risks and create that space and support the cause of regulation in the interest of the public good, I think we actually will end up protected from the worst actors. We will deal still with this long chemical legacy um, of chemicals like DDT where some of the harms won't become apparent for decades. And one thing we didn't talk about was the fact that DDT is linked to higher rates of cancer. But again, sticking with the theme of optimism, if it's even possible in such a context, there are chemicals with much stronger connections to cancer. There are other factors linked to some of our most just terrifying chronic diseases. I think on balance, we do ourselves a favor when we ask for as much transparency as possible when we allow government and industry to engage as much as possible in open exchange of information about risks and benefits, and when we continue to demand that they do that in the interest of keeping the public safe. Those are great comments to end on. Elena, thank you so much. This was so fascinating, such a rich history, such a fantastic book. Thank you for walking us through this tangled story and, and, and telling this history again for our audience, which has been a really substantial audience for the full hour. Thank you all for sticking with us. So that is it for this edition of the Health Storytelling Author Q&A series. Please consider following Elena on social media. You can see her handle at Elena Konis on the screen. And please buy the book, which is available at Bold Type Books, which is her publisher, at Amazon, of course, and at bookshop.org. And it's also available at your local brick and mortar bookstore. And if you follow the links we're going to put in the comments on whatever platform you're watching on, you will see the links to all of these, including to IndieBound.com, 
which will guide you to a local independent brick and mortar bookstore that is stocking the book. So thank you again for listening to Elena and I talk about the history of DDT. Please join us next month on March 23rd when Bethany Brookshire will discuss her fantastic book, Pests, How Humans Create Animal Villains. That event within this series is going to be a co-production with the Atlanta Science Festival. And also join us on April 12th when Stephen Thrasher will discuss his book, The Viral Underclass, The Human Toll When Inequality and Disease Collide. Until next time, I'm Marin McKenna. On behalf of the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University and the Georgia Center for the Book and Science Gallery Atlanta, and from me, thank you for watching.